Hey, North Coast, we're so glad that you're with us today. My name is Lynn, and I'm one of the pastors on staff here. If you're looking for sermon notes or more information, you can go online to northcoastchurch.com. We're continuing in our sermon series, Mark, the untold story of Jesus. So grab your Bibles and jump in. We hope you enjoy. It's, uh, it's no secret that Jesus said some things that were rather hard to understand. Uh, his own disciples didn't get everything that he had to say, as we've been seeing as we work through the book of Mark. So, frankly, it shouldn't surprise us if we don't understand everything in this book and everything Jesus said. Now, he said a ton of stuff that was crystal clear and very simple. Uh, as he said at one time, uh, the stuff you need to enter the kingdom of heaven is understandable by even a little child. But still along the way, uh, sometimes he spoke in hyperboles. Uh, sometimes he used metaphors. Uh, he used colloquial phrases. He said things that they maybe understood then, but 2,000 years later, we don't know what that's a word picture of or, 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 or quite how that fits. And, and today is one of those passages. It's got in it a couple of those things where uh, uh, there can be some uh, uh, cards and letters afterward going, hey, will you explain this to me? And I just want to tell you right now on a couple of those, no, because uh, I have no idea. Uh, if you've been a Christian uh, very long, you know that there's almost a cottage industry uh, that has, has come up uh, of folks uh, that either in books or podcasts or whatever, they, <coughs> they major on answering the unanswerable. But if you stop and think about it, all they are is one more bit of speculation. In fact, it reminds me of some of my favorite uh, uh, communication cards, the worship response cards, that will begin with, I know we can't know for sure, but it's like, or I know you don't know, but it's like, so what do I say after that? I just make something up or what? Because the fact is, there are some things that uh, we just uh, don't know. Uh, it reminds me of a, a passage that the Apostle Paul wrote uh, to a young man named Timothy who he'd left in a region called Ephesus. We've got our book of the Bible called Ephesians was written to them. And he left him there as a young man to set in order all the house churches that had newly been planted. And he, he told them to stay away, make sure you shut down and stay away from people who love controversy. You might remember last weekend we, we talked about that. Not discussion, not debate, but divisive uh, controversy. And then here's what he says about them. He says, they want to be teachers of the law, but they don't know what they're talking about or what they so confidently affirm. Uh, so frankly, if you want to know Jesus and how to follow him well, it's pretty simple. Don't worry so much about the stuff you don't understand as making sure you live in light of the stuff you do understand. Amen? It's really pretty simple. And uh, today, in this passage, it has both crystal clear and like, huh? Uh, we're going to focus on the crystal clear within it and see what it has to say to us about how the Lord wants us to live. Uh, now, by, by way of what's been going on, Jesus, uh, for the second time in, uh, on the way to Jerusalem where he's going to die, has been telling his, his followers that he's going there to be killed and he's going to raise again on the third day. And after this second time, we saw in the last few messages that they had no idea what he was talking about and they immediately began, as he's talking about going to suffer, to discuss among themselves who's going to have the highest positions in his new administration after he overthrows the Romans. So what he does is he gathers them all together and uh, sets them in a room. It's a house with just the 12 and, and some family members, but it's no longer the crowds. And as he calls the 12 together, he discusses three things that we saw two weeks ago, last week, and we're going to see this week. So here we go. The first thing that he told them about was how to really be first in the kingdom. He says, you guys got it all wrong as you've been arguing about it. You become first in my kingdom by serving others. Then he looked around, saw a child in the house and said, come here. And in that culture where children were to uh, be seen and not heard, were not the valued part of a family, partly just because of mortality issues uh, that we think of in our culture today, they were the least of the least. He says, you know what? You got to serve one like this little one here. And then... 
John raises his hand and says, as we saw last weekend, hey, there was a guy out there doing ministry in your name, casting out demons, but he's not one of us, so we told him to shut up. And Jesus goes, oh, man, you guys don't get it. I want to tell you not only how to be first in the kingdom, but now, guys, I want to explain to you who's on our team. And uh, last weekend, we talked about our tendency to draw the circle too small. And Jesus says, whoever is not against us is for us when it comes to advancing the kingdom. And uh, you should never have a, a, a desire or activity that protects your power, your prestige, your position, kind of us for and no more. We need to make sure our circle is as big as Jesus' circle. And then we come to the couple of verses we're going to look at today. And again, they all take place at the same time after he's called his guys together, is shutting them down for their argument of who's going to be first. It literally says kind of a rabbi's position. It says that he pulled up a chair and he sat down with the 12 in front of them and whoever else was in the household, and he went through these things. Well, after telling them how to be first in the kingdom with a couple of sentences, who's on your team with a couple of sentences, he now tells them how to go to hell, which is not what you expected. But that's literally what he does. That's why I've titled this teaching, The Highway to Hell. We're going to see, he kind of starts out how to be first in the kingdom, and if you're not getting this, okay, here's the highway to hell. So, you want to see the highway to hell uh, in the Bible, not the song? Okay, here we go, okay? Uh, Find Mark chapter 9, as we continue where we've been going these last few weeks, and we're going to look at verses 42 to 50. Mark chapter 9, verses 42 to 50. And again, remember, it's all one continuing thing that we've paused. It's a forest. uh, It's a conversation, and we just stopped and dialed in a whole message on each scene in the short little uh, movie clip, if you will. So here we go. If anyone causes one of these little ones, now notice in your Bible the next phrase in in Mark 9, 42. These little ones, those who what? Talk to me. Believe. Believe. Underline that in your Bible. It's going to become very important. So he's speaking of children who believe in me, in Jesus. Anyone who causes one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble... Well, it'd be better for them if a large millstone was hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea to be drowned. Uh, the millstone, if you've ever seen a millstone, uh, the, the phrase that's used there is, is not the one that was turned by a person, which would cause you to drown with its weight anyway, but the ones that were actually turned by a donkey or an animal. So you've got this huge, massive, about that thick, big old round stone thrown around your neck, cast in the sea. And he says, you know what, as bad as that is, it would be better to have that happen to you than for you to cause one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble. And then he switches gears. No longer the little ones, he turns to the 12, and he says this. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. Better to enter life maimed than to go into hell. Verse 45, and if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. Now, understand, folks, those of you brand new, these are hyperboles, okay? But uh, they're very strong statements about what we are to do. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. Where, and he's quoting Isaiah here, the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Now do you see why I call it the highway to hell? You cause these little ones to stumble or you stumble because of your hand, your foot, your eye. He says, man, it is better to get rid of these things completely because the end result is this place called hell. Everyone will be salted with fire. Now, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, in other words, if you know anything about salt, it doesn't like over time lose its saltiness. That's, uh, this is like a colloquial phrase that's used. If it's not able to do what it's supposed to do anymore, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. Man, you want to be first in the kingdom? Serve other people, the lowest of the low in culture and society's eyes. 
and make sure that you understand we are all in this together if we were followers of Jesus. Not just those in our little circle, but those in Jesus' circle. And by the way, make sure you don't cause anybody to stumble. Any little one who believes in me, because you'll end up in hell. And make sure if your hand, your foot, or your eye is causing you to stumble, man, pluck it out. Because it is better to miss these incredibly great and important things that end up in eternity separated from the Lord. Well, that's a pretty straightforward passage. But here's the thing. What do we do with it on Monday? <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, okay, I read these things. On, but, but what does it really mean? As you can see on your note sheet, I've, I call it, I'm calling it four questions. Well, what is stumbling here? Because it's a big deal. I don't want to do that in my own life or someone else's life, right? And, uh, and, and, and who are these little ones for me today, not the kid that was in the room? And uh, what causes little ones to stumble? And what causes us to stumble? What are the things that these hyperboles, these metaphors, these word pictures are painting to, in a, uh, pointing to in a real day-to-day -day sense. And that's what I want to spend the whole balance of our, our, our time at uh, today. So uh, let's take a, a dig into these four important questions that jump out of this short little passage. And the first one is, what does it mean to cause someone to stumble? Well, I, I want to give you a couple of things you might jot down. Biblically, Okay, because in, in, in modern day English, we say we cause someone to stumble. That can mean a lot of things. Trip and fall, almost fall, all kinds of things are included in that. But the biblical concept of stumbling is this, to fall away completely. It's not that you annoyed somebody. It's not that you upset them. It's not that you caused a little setback in their life. The biblical concept of stumbling is to fall away completely completely. And I think you can see it in the verses we just read in terms of what causes you to stumble. Three times Jesus equated someone who stumbles as someone who goes to what? Help me. You can say it in church. Hell, right? It's, it's not like, well, they sinned or they did this or they did that. Causing someone to stumble as he's using it in this uh, uh, passage is to cause someone to completely and totally cut off any relationship with Jesus Christ. Now that raises a question. Can a, can a person who is a believer, these little ones who believe in me, the 12, can we have what we call, can we what we call be saved and lose our salvation? And just a little sidebar here, the Bible seems to speak quite clearly that we do not earn our salvation. So the, when Jesus cried out, paid in full, it is finished. It was paid in full, and it is finished. We are saved by grace, unmerited favor, not by the works of the Old Testament law. But as we've seen over and over, a nod to God is not the same thing as following God. Believing facts about Jesus is not the same thing. As uh, uh, Chris Brown mentioned a couple of weeks ago, the demons believe, according to James, that he's the son of God, that he died, that he rose again, and, and I don't expect them to live next door to me forever in heaven. So... Uh, the idea that you somehow were a Christian and now you fell into some sin, even gross, high-handed sin, and now you're not, but now you get right with God, and you're kind of like a yo-yo up and down. The Bible has nothing to do with that. Uh, this, this idea that it's how good have you been? Uh, have you done anything and not made it right with God? No, our sins are forgiven. But what about this possibility of just slowly moving to the point that we haven't just fallen into sin, our heart has become so hardened we don't even desire to come back again. There's some passages in the Bible that seem to imply that as a possibility. I think of one in Hebrews 6, uh, in particular, the first few verses there. But here's the thing. I don't want to get into the theological argument, could someone lose it, couldn't they, whatever. I just want us all to understand the warning of this passage. And the warning of this passage was not spoken to the crowd, it was spoken to the, the 12, right? Now, one of them actually fit the bill. His name was what? Judas, right? And Judas seems at one point to have believed Jesus was the Messiah. I mean, he, Jesus called him to himself, you know? And uh, uh, Jesus wasn't quite the big thing that he ended up when Judas joins up and signs up. 
Uh, Judas, at one point, when the 12 were sent out to do miracles, when the 72 were sent out city to city to do miracles two by two, when they came back, nobody said, wow, everybody could pull stuff off, but this guy Judas over here. He seems to have had power work in his life. Uh, the, the fruit of his life seemed to be so committed that the other guys made him treasurer. You know, you don't normally, you know, that guy looks like a thief. Let's make him treasurer. Now, he was pilfering money the whole time, we are, we are told. But the, the, the warning here I want us to, to, to catch is about falling away absolutely and completely. And I want us to at least struggle with the fact, because it doesn't fit all my theological paradigms, and I never want my theology to interpret the Bible. I want the Bible to create my theology. Is this passage, he says, if your hand, your foot, your eye... And he's speaking to who? The 12. Okay. That inner circle. Wow. I think he's speaking to us. And he also refers to little ones who, as I pointed out, believe in me. So what does it mean to cause someone to stumble? It means to cause them to fall away completely. And when we cause someone to do something that destroys their faith. So it's not just that they fell away completely, it's that I am responsible for whatever thing it is that caused them to have their faith destroyed. Now last weekend I took a little sidebar and a shot at this thing called legalism. If you recall, legalism are the extra man-made rules by hyperdog Christians who figure God was too busy to get all the rules in the Bible, so they take some Bible verses and add new rules to them and equate them with the Bible. Uh, I mentioned I grew up in a church that had more rules than Jesus could have ever thought of. Uh, Every single uh, rule we had was based on the Bible. It just wasn't found in the Bible. And this idea of stumbling, a little sidebar to pick up what we did last weekend, uh, this has been misused by legalists forever. Because what they've done is they've said, you know what? You should never do anything that annoys, hassles, or offends anybody. And you should never do anything that someone might see you do and misinterpret as if you were doing something bad. They take a verse, I don't think it's on your note sheet. If you, you want to look it up later, you can look it up. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. Uh, for those of you that are new, First Thessalonians, that's a long word. So just write T-H-E-S-S, you'll find it in your concordance. I mean in your table of contents. But uh, here's what it says in the old Shakespearean King James English, a translation that was done in the early 1600s. Abstain from all appearances of evil. Okay? Now, literally, it says uh, abstain from every form of evil. But back in 1611, an uh, appropriate, you know, language has changed quite a bit from Shakespeare's days. It was every appearance of evil. So by the time I'm growing up, people are telling me if anybody could misinterpret it. So what that meant is you, uh, you know, things like I think I mentioned someone last weekend. You couldn't go to a movie because someone, you know, especially a multiplex, because someone might think you went to the wrong one when you came out. You know, uh, you couldn't have a beer because somebody might think it was your 30th. Uh, you, uh, you couldn't play cards or poker because somebody might think you're addicted to gambling. Or somebody who has a problem with any of those things might have seen you do it as a Christian. And now they decide it is okay for me. And so we got this whole goofy set of things where we were told, well, these aren't in the Bible, but you have to follow them anyway. Uh, see, that's what legalism is. Now, now catch this. All of us, when we're in the presence of somebody who is offended or bothered by a behavior we have freedom in, should sublimate and set aside that behavior. Philippians 2, 3 to 5, do nothing out of selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, put the needs and interests of others as more important than your own. I mean, why, why would I stand up and say, well, I have the freedom to do this when I know it's a bothersome thing to you? It's like, like when I know that, it's like, oh, game over. That's not, by the way, hypocrisy, that's love, okay? That's changing my behavior in light of whom I'm in front of out of love. But what you don't want to do, and why I'm pointing out what's stumbling here is, you don't want to live in such a way that somebody might be offended, so you're always looking over your shoulder for some hypothetical person who just might show up and just might misunderstand that completely innocent thing you're doing. So therefore, all your freedom in Christ is a wonderful idea, but please never actually experience it. That's, that's what legalism does, okay? 
So that's a sidebar building on what we said last time because this concept of causing someone to stumble is, 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 is so misused. If you see me do something that you have a strong problem with and therefore you go and do it, I'm not at fault as we're going to see uh, later on in this passage. But if I know you're bothered, you're offended, you're hurt, great. I will change my life and set aside my freedoms in Christ all day long to advance the gospel. Little other sidebar in this, by the way. Some of you that are students at Christian organizations, I don't know if you've noticed, but once in a while Christian organizations add some extra rules. And, you know, the, one, the college I went to had all kinds of goofy rules. I mean, from how long your hair could be to all kinds of things like that. But here was an important thing. The character that God calls us to have is a character where our yes is yes and our no is no. Right? And I signed a thing saying, I won't do this and I won't do that. As goofy as I thought it was, as long as I was at that school, I had given my word that I was going to follow that pattern. I need to follow that pattern. And it wasn't giving in to legalism there. It was exchanging a bunch of goofy rules for the education they gave me. And if I'm president of a college, I get rid of those rules. Of course, the donors probably kill me, but that's another thing. But... Uh, you see where I'm going with that? Uh, you know, your, your, your freedom in Christ is a very, very important thing to hold on to. Now, when the Bible calls it sin, you have no freedom. We don't get to make our rules. I'm talking about these extra areas. But out of love, we put the needs and interests of others first. And out of integrity, when we say we're going to do something, whether we think it's goofy or not, we go and do it. What does it mean to cause someone to stumble? Well, in this passage and everywhere else in the Bible... It is to fall completely away. Now, let's look at the second question. Anyone who causes these little ones who believe in me to stumble. So, who are these little ones? Well, literally, when Jesus said those words, they were the children in the room. The children in the room. I want you to see the verses we saw earlier in this short little section. So if you're still in Mark, just look up a few verses and look at Mark chapter 9, verses 35 to 37. I'm going to put them up here on the screen so we can see them. This is the beginning of the conversation we're now seeing the end of today. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. And he took a literal little child whom he placed among them that was in the house with the twelve and whatever family they were at. And taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. So when Jesus says, These little children who believe in me, five, six sentences later, which little children is he talking about? The ones in that household. Now, why is this important? Because obviously that concept applies to youngsters, young believers. But very specifically, and where I want to spend some time today, it applies to the children in our households. It applies to the children in our household. And I don't know if you've ever thought, those of you who've had a longer time of studying the Bible, you've ever thought of this passage as being a passage about your son's and your daughters, who often share the, the, their, uh, their faith is more our faith than their faith at that point, but in a childlike way, they believe in Jesus. And he's saying, man, Larry, you make sure these little ones in your household that you don't cause to stumble. And that leads to question three. And questions three and four, we're going to spend the rest of our time. What things cause our little ones to stumble. Now, I could do a whole message, or we could do a whole series on parenting, but I want to take three things in particular that over and over and over cause kids that are raised in a so-called Christian home to kick the traces as soon as they can. If you're a grandparent, Pray for your kids and them. <laughs> Don't act like you're the parent. You're the grandparent. Pray like crazy. If you're a parent, these are things that are incredibly important. If you're a friend of someone, these are the things to give some advice to. 
And I want to dial in on three of them. Again, we could do more, but three of the most common things that cause the little ones in our household, who we bring to Sunday school, who we uh, see kind of have an interest, and then by the time they're adults, they've turned away. And here's the first one. Harshness. Harshness. I want you to see a couple of verses with your own eyes. So uh, we're in Mark. If you're new at all this, like so many of you are, use your table of contents. But in the New Testament, I want you to find a couple of letters. And uh, the first one is a letter uh, that was, uh, is found in a book called Colossians. Colossians. So go to the right from Mark where you got all these letters, Galatians, Ephesians, if you see that, Philippians. Then you got a little book called Colossians just a few chapters long, and it was written by the Apostle Paul to Christians that were in a town called Colossae. And it was more of a circular letter. It started there, but it passed on to all the churches, thus became part of our Bible. And in Colossians chapter 3, verse 21, he speaks to parents. Now, in that culture, it says fathers, because a very patriarchal society would speak to a single mom would speak to a single dad. It would speak to a married couple. And it's a command. Now, parents like this one. Children, blank, your parents. What is it? Obey, Obey your parents. Don't you love that one? Okay, uh, it's like you, you want that on the wall of their bedroom. <laughs> but we need to remember in those same passages, here's what it says. Colossians 3.21. Fathers, do not what? Embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. That word embitter, the Greek word means to stir up, provoke, irritate, or exasperate. Now, here's what I want you to catch. Don't provoke, irritate, exasperate your children, not from your viewpoint, but from their viewpoint. Now, you can be the best parent ever, and would you agree with me, there's going to be times your kids have a meltdown? Uh, there's going to be times, not only when they're little, but when they're older, when they're going to think you're the weirdest, oldest, meanest, strictest human being that ever walked the face of the earth. We're talking here about a pattern, though, a pattern of harshness, where it's, uh, it's, it, it, it becomes literally exasperating. And now I want you to turn, you're in Colossians, so just go to the left a couple of books and, and find Ephesians. You'll see Philippians when you go to the left and then find Ephesians. And find chapter 6, verse 4. Ephesians, E-P-H-E-S-I-A-N-S, -S, chapter 6, verse 4. And he's got a contrast here. Fathers, Ephesians 6, 4, do not, what's the word in this one? Help me. Exasperate your children. Instead, so he's juxtapositioning these two things against each other. Exasperating's on one side. What's the other side? Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. In other words, a very important part of bringing up our children in the Lord is not to exasperate and not to embitter. One small little example that I know I had to struggle with as a parent. This is a description, not a prescription, just an example to put some wheels on it. But uh, if you were more of a structured person with when you wake up and when you go to sleep, you're more of a structured person in how neat you keep a room and all of that. And you have a child who kind of lives on a slightly different, not slightly, massively different biological clock and has a massively different definition of what clean is, you see how you can be harsh in that area, right? Because you're, and, 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 and you see after a while they, that gets exasperating and, and because they don't have that same agenda, they don't have that same definition you do. Well, that's fine on, on certain things in life, but when you kind of have a pattern where you were getting a child and some of you grew up in those homes where you just felt you could never do anything right. Uh, you grew up in that home where it was always a standard that was a little bit higher than you could do. Every day it was about how well you did, but that's exasperating. 
And, and in Scripture, here's what happens. We're often saying, you will thank me someday. Ever heard that one? But they don't. They're on some counselor's couch griping about us someday, you know? I mean, there are some things you will thank me someday. Absolutely. We've all been there like, oh, I see that one differently. But I'm talking here about harshness, and here's the problem. Those that of, of us that are harsh don't usually call ourselves harsh. We just think, well, I'm kind of strict. And we're always doing it in our mind for their best interest. But one of the things you need to watch is not just the fruit of their behavior, but the fruit of their heart. Because when you have harshness, it creates embitteredness that exasperates. We have a problem. Now, I'm going to give you two little subs you might jot down. And just think about this weekend, especially those of you that are privileged to have kids under roof right now. But one of them is unrealistic expectations. Man, I know as an adult, talking to other adults, people with parent wounds or father wounds, that one of the huge ones, besides a lack of affirmation, is simply unrealistic expectations. Expecting a five-year-old to think like a 10-year-old. Uh, I- I- expecting someone to always do their best, even though we don't always do our best. And we always say, I want the best for you. And it's, it's actually, I want bragging rights as a parent, I think. Unrealistic expectations. And the second is overprotection. Overprotection. Strict rules about everything, even for their good. Helicopter parenting creates an embittering noose that chokes and strangles our children. Overprotection creates hothouse Christians. And when you grow a hothouse Christian, you really have not prepared your children for two things. To live in the real world when they're out from under your roof. And to be a light to the world, which we are called to be. Jesus said, you don't take a light and put it under a basket. No, you put it on a hill so everybody can see. Our job is not to be in a holy huddle hiding so nothing wrecks us. Our job is to be out there in the real marketplace, in the real world, not just with other Christians, making a difference for Jesus. And if you harshly hover over, overprotect, unrealistic expectations, all of that to protect them so someday they will thank you, in the reality, you're not preparing them for the real world. And when they get out from under, they're just going to go, well, this isn't as bad as I thought. Oh, these people aren't so horrible as you painted. Oh, this and that. And I've seen it time after time after time. Hot house Christians somewhere around 18 to 26, 27 become former Christians. Over and over and over. Harshness. Watch out for it. Because it will cause your little ones to stumble. Again, not some standards. We'll talk about that in this next one. Because the second thing that can cause them to stumble is spiritual indifference. Now, what I find, last weekend we talked about the, the circle. Uh, how big is your circle? Uh, I, I mentioned that longtime high committed Christians have a tendency to make the circle too small. And those of us that are brand new in our walk with God because of our culture tend to say, What circle? You know, there's just like no boundaries anywhere. Well, this is kind of the same thing because a highly committed Christian is more likely to be harsh and a brand new follower of Jesus is more likely to offer spiritual indifference. Well, you know, I'm just going to let them decide on their own how they're going to go. Really? You're going to let them decide whether to sleep, whether to go to school, whether to brush their teeth? Oh, no, no. We're going to have standards there. And you're going to have no spiritual standards in your household? Are you kidding me? So apparently brushing your teeth is more important than following God. I just like, excuse, I, I like to call it the rule of the roof. When you're under my roof, you're going to follow my rules. Now, they need not to be harsh, but it's not, yeah, what, whatever, it's all good. Spiritual indifference is simply this. It's a lack of spiritual guidance and discipline. A lack of spiritual guidance and discipline. And I've got verses on your note sheet, so I'm just going to read them for the sake of time, and you can look back at them more carefully. But Proverbs 22, 6, raise or start children off in the way they should go, and even when they're old, they will not turn from it. 
It's not let them do whatever they want and they will turn towards it. <laughs> Start early and right. Listen to this one, Proverbs 13, 24. Whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. Now, please, th this is not a verse about spanking one way or the other. It's a verse about discipline. Uh, because the spanking that we call abusive and harsh and all that, guess what? That follows under the embittering. Uh, that, that, that follows under, un, under the harshness thing. And you're going to have to figure out whether you're going to live on timeouts or a little swat in the butt will care. Obviously, there's not a point where you're leaving bruises, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Our, our culture kind of swings the pendulum. And, and then we go to this verse to, quote, defend spanking. It's like, it's not the issue. Here's what the verse is about. Discipline. The verse is, man, the one who never disciplines their child in a way that creates enough pain, be it the timeout or the swat, doesn't love. And the other verse here is from Hebrews about God's work with us. My son, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. Don't lose heart when he rebukes you. He disciplines us because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, not abusively, not off the wall, not overreacting, not harsh but with a loving sense of I'm not going to be indifferent. I'm going to step into this situation. And here's the third one. The third one is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. As I've told you often, I'll tell you again, what we consider to be discretion, our kids see as hypocrisy. Because our kids buy our values, but they set their own boundaries. So when my kids see that I, I preach honesty, but I'm not honest when somebody calls and I tell them, tell them I'm not here. Uh, when, when, when they see me deciding that there's some times where I can fudge the truth, they're going, oh, okay. And they're going to decide where they do it. By the way, I want to challenge some of you who uh, have kids that are in all these traveling squads and all of that, and you're just like totally into that. I, I, I want to challenge you to think about what you're teaching your kids, because a lot of us are teaching our kids that church is very important unless there's a championship. And then when they go away to college, they decide that church is very important unless they need some sleep or have some friends or a big test. And then you're calling one of us as pastors and go, oh, what do I do? They just, and it's like, dude, they're doing exactly what you taught them. They will adapt your values, but they will then put in their own boundaries. And what we are is what we will get. Circle Luke 6, 39 to 42 on your note sheet. Where Jesus says, everyone who's fully trained will be like his teacher. And then right after, you know, so they become like us. And then right after that, listen to what he says. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye, in this case, think your kid's eye, and pay no attention to the plank in your own? He goes, first take the plank out of your own eye, then you can see to take the speck out of theirs. Folks, in the context of this, this is teacher-student, this is parent-child. Well... Can we all admit we all have, and I've been there as well, we have this tendency to tell our kids, do as I say, not as I do, and they are watching completely our honesty, our, 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 our keeping of our commitments, our, our, our sexuality, our, our priorities. They are watching all of those things, and I can't try to keep the speck out of their eye when I got a big old plank in my own. What things cause our little ones to stumble? Well, this is kind of two sermons in one, so, because Jesus did it, it's all his fault. What causes us to stumble? The last fourth question. That he puts the two of them together. What things cause me to stumble? And I've got three little phrases I want to give you, and then I'll flesh them out. The first one is this, when it comes to stumbling, just falling completely away. Remember, that's what we're talking about. Different lures catch different fish. Different lures catch different fish. So when it comes to what causes me to stumble, your list is going to be different than my list when it comes to your hand, your foot, your eye, whatever other good things or whatever other tempting things are in your life. Because notice, hand, foot, and eye, would you all agree they're good things? Okay? 
He's not saying get rid of these things. He's saying if they cause you to stumble. And different lures catch different fish. It's not the lure that catches the fish. It's the fish's appetite. It's not the lure that catches the fish. It's the fish's appetite. That's why I can never say, well, God, why did you allow that to happen to me? Or, God, why did you do this or that? Or, or say, well, it's not my fault because, and I put some temptation right in front of me. You know, there's a whole lot of people that will walk by an unlocked car and let it go. There's a whole lot of people that will walk by uh, uh, inappropriate sexual advance and ignore it, and other people won't. There's a whole lot of people that will change the channel. There's a whole lot of people that I can go on and on. It is not the lure. Oh, it's that fault. I couldn't help it. It is your appetite. And here's what the Bible says when the temptation comes from within, what we would call desire, an internal temptation that causes us to stumble. The Bible says, when tempted by an internal desire, you and I should run. The Bible is crystal clear on this. Because the problem isn't the lure, the problem is my appetite. And so the more I go, hmm, looks good, oh, licks good, it will not be long until it hooks good. That's how it works. And, and, and so on your note sheet under this one, I've got 2 Timothy 2.22, flee the evil desires of youth. When it comes to sexuality, 1 Corinthians 16, flee sexual immorality. But it's kind of any temptation that you have. If you have a temptation that greed, uh, that only surfaces when you're around people that have lots of stuff, stay away from people who have lots of stuff. If you don't have a temptation to greed, enjoy their stuff, you know? I mean... Better to have a friend with a boat than own one, whatever. <laughs> right? If you're suddenly tempted to buy and spend money you don't have, well, then stay away from those things. If that's not a temptation that you have, you know, browse the internet and Amazon all day long. Know what kills you. And avoid it like the plague. Because you will never become strong enough to face off an internal temptation. When it's an external temptation, when it's a hardship or a trial that is brought upon me, I've always got the exact... In fact, we tend to get these two things wrong. So let me first of all give you this one to write down. When tempted by an external trial or hardship, stand firm. When tempted by an external trial or hardship, stand firm. And I've often talked about how we shift these. So when all hell is breaking loose, when my marriage is not what I wanted it to be, when the job commitment I made, not just job, you're not stuck in a job, but you made some commitment or whatever, and it's not turning out exactly like you want. In our whole culture, we just leave commitments and situations because they're hard. Now, you have the freedom to leave something as long as you're not spiritually compromising when you leave or sinning when you leave. But, there, but, but we, in fact, we will lie to get out of a hardship, okay? Uh, we'll lie on loan papers to get a loan so we can get the house we otherwise couldn't have gotten. We'll do all these kind of things because, well, the trial is hard. And the Bible says, no, when the trial is hard, dig your feet in and stand up against it. And Satan will run from you. But we want to run. And then the Bible says, man, when something is internally tempting, run from it. And what do we do? We go, well, I'll pray about it. You know? You know, it's, it's, it's like the dating couple trying to stay pure in their relationship. And they go, well, let's, why don't you come over to my apartment and we'll pray. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and again, you see this in all of life, not just sin things, you know? I mean, uh, has anybody ever here gone on a diet? Just wondering. I never have. <laughs> what, what do you do when you try to swear off something? Is it really easy to, like, set it in front of you every day? You know, a while back I decided, you know, it's probably not good to have a half gallon of ice cream every night. <laughs> Some of you decided that as well, right? 
So I told Nancy, make sure the freezer's well stocked. <laughs> no. Now, those aren't sin issues. But in sin issues, we've got to do it. Know what tempts you. Different lures catch different fish. And run like crazy from the things that have hooked you before. Don't think this one is different. But when it's a trial, when it's a hardship, dig in. Because here's what God has promised. In the midst of a hardship, he will give you one day at a time, that day's strength and power to stand. But here's what he hasn't promised. In the midst of an internal temptation, he will give you power because he's already given you instructions. Run. Run. Little series of lessons on the kingdom. To absolutely be first, serve other people. And this is a tough, huge thing. Jesus came to reach the world, not to hide from the world. So make sure we don't draw our circle smaller than he draws it. And let's also be careful, because there is a highway to hell. And let's be very, very careful with our children. We can't guarantee the outcome. I mean, there was rebellion against God and sin in the Garden of Eden in the first few chapters of our Bible. You've got Adam and Eve. You've got a perfect environment. You have perfect parenting, if you want to call God that. You have no sin nature, and you still have rebellion. We cannot cause an outcome, but we can influence an outcome with our little ones. Don't be harsh and say, you'll thank me someday. And don't be indifferent as if, well, they need to make their own decision. That decision is way, way too important. And whatever it is you want for your children, make sure you live for your Lord. Because they see, they know more than we ever, ever would guess. And when it comes to living for our Lord, that's why Jesus turns the mirror. It starts with getting the plank out of our own eye. Know what causes you to stumble. And even if it's your hand, your foot, or your eye, cut it off. Because our eternity, our spiritual rewards, are greater than all the other false gods and false treasures we would ever chase. Father, would you take the things that we have looked at today and as always, I pray you'd use them to speak to our hearts about who we are and how we walk, not to evaluate who others are and how they walk. Father, I thank you that as it says in Proverbs, a righteous man even falls seven times and rises again. I thank you that you cried out, it is finished, it is paid in full. We're not on some arduous, incredibly difficult journey to earn our way to you. But in the midst of all that grace and all that mercy that you've given us, may we not presume upon it. May we work with you for the eternity of our children. And may we obey you for the model we leave to them. In the name of Jesus. Well, as always, we would love to connect with you online. If you have a question, comment, or prayer request, we would love to hear from you. You can send that to info at northcoastchurch.com. We also want to thank you for your continued generous support. If you'd like to give, you can donate online or through our North Coast app. We hope that you were encouraged and challenged by this message. We'll see you next week.